Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Fee. Uh, it's my honor uh, to introduce our speaker today, uh, who will give the third annual Philip A. Sharp Lecture in Neural Circuits. Uh, this lecture series was sponsored by Biogenetic to honor the contributions of Phil Sharp, who's with us today. Uh, one of these was his role in helping to found Biogenetic, um, a leading biotech company, as well as his uh, contributions here at MIT. He was chairman of the biology department, uh, as well as uh, uh, director of MIT's cancer, uh, Center for Cancer Research. In addition, Phil uh, was the founding director of the McGovern Institute for Brain Research. So it's also my honor uh, and privilege to host our speaker today, uh, Professor Maybrit Moser. Dr. Moser is one of the founding directors of the Kavli Institute for Systems Neuroscience and of the Norwegian Institute of Science and Technology in Trondheim, Norway. Maybrit received her PhD in neurophysiology at the University of Oslo. Uh, under the supervision of Per Anderson. Uh, she went on to a short postdoctoral position in the lab of Richard Morris, of Morris Watermay's fame, uh, before beginning her appointment at the Norwegian Institute of Science and Technology. Since then, Dr. Moser has co-led with her husband, Edvard Moser, a remarkable research team that has, in the last decade, produced some of the most astounding advances in our understanding of the brain circuitry underlying spatial navigation. One of these, one of the most remarkable of these, was their publication in 2005 uh, of a paper describing the discovery of grid cells in the medial entorhinal cortex. Since then, they have gone on to um, describe the properties of the neurons as well as their interactions with cortical and hippocampal circuits. Maybrit has received numerous awards for her beautiful research, but one of these I would particularly like to uh, focus on uh, because it really emphasizes her, um, something about her that is uh, really remarkable, which is her commitment to the human side of science. Uh, she recently won from a Norwegian um, uh, business society the award for best female boss for her consistent focus on teamwork and uh, community spirit. So um, I hope you'll join me today in welcoming Maybrit Moser uh, for this lecture. So thank you very much, Michael, for these nice words. And I have to say, I was very proud to be elected as the business female of, uh, in Trondheim. So that was funny that you got to know. And uh, thank you for you and the organizers for inviting me. Thank you for Sharp for supporting this lecture. It's a great, great honor to be one of the speakers in this lecture series. And I have enjoyed the day here with all this fantastic science that is going on. And I know that I just saw this tiny, tiny bit of it. So I would love to spend weeks here just to learn what you all are doing. And it was also so fantastic to meet all the postdocs. So what I, I would like to tell you about today is uh, grid cells, play cells, and neural maps for space. And I want to start just with the vision of all of us in neuroscience. What do we really want to understand in neuroscience? We want to understand how the brain is generating mental functions. But that's a bit almost a, a, a rude idea to have because the brain is so complicated and can we understand ourselves? And we know that all these neurons, all these billions of neurons, they connect to so many other billions of neurons. So how can we ever understand this complicated thing that we have between our ears. We can start by looking into humans, humans with lesions. And I'm going to play one of my favorite movies here with a man who was a musician. He worked in England for BBC and he got a herpes infection to his brain, eating part of the medial temporal lobe. 
And what happened to him is that he lost his memory. He couldn't find his way. And when, when he's talking here in this movie that we will see in a, in a tiny bit, you will understand what a disaster it is for us humans if we don't have this part of the brain. One man is consigned to live entirely within the present with terrible consequences. Clive Waring has the worst case of amnesia ever known. 20 years ago, he lost his memory, and now his wife, Deborah, is the only person he recognizes. The second wife. <laughs> Clive really only has less than 30 seconds memory. And to say about it, it's just like death. Mm. No thoughts of any kind, no dreams, no difference between day and night, no sight, no sound, no taste, no touch, no smell, exactly like death. No difference between day and night. No thoughts, nothing. As far as I'm concerned, the doctors have been totally incompetent. I've never seen a doctor the whole time. <laughs> oh, look, it's come. Oh, <laughs> Mm. <laughs> I'm dizzy. I don't know which part of the room I'm standing in. How many dogs? So, his wife was just in the kitchen to get a cup of to uh, co uh, coffee or tea, and he saw her and thought he hadn't seen her for ages because he had no memory. And this is uh, his notes in uh, his diary here. And it says here, at 8.12 in the morning, I'm awake. But then he is disturbed, and then he's crossing it out, and then he's coming back at 9.24 a.m. Now I'm awake, but I wasn't, because I wasn't conscious. So it's really a devastating problem that Clive Wearing has. He reminds us about another person that we have learned about a long time ago, H.M., who also had a lesion in the medial temporal lobe. And he got that from his surgeon, who wanted to relieve him from epileptic seizures, and he removed the hippocampus and part of the medial and, uh, temporal lobe. And like Cl Clive Wearing, after this uh, surgery, H.M. could not recognize hospital staff. He couldn't learn new faces, new names. He couldn't learn new things. He couldn't remember new episodes. And he couldn't find his way to the bathroom. So his spatial navigation system was also not functioning. And for the next 55 years, each time he met a friend, each time he ate a meal, each time he walked in the woods, it was like it was for the first time. So that made neuroscientists interested in this structure, the hippocampus. This is the human hippocampus dissected out, and you see why it got its name. Hippocampus is the seahorse. So then people wanted to explore these areas in the brain. And the hippocampus of this cute rat here, we can, in, in this area we can record electrical potential while this rat is just happily running around. And we can then try to find out what behavior correlates is activating this, uh, this cell. And this is exactly what John O'Keefe did when he, in the 70s, discovered the place cell. And I'm going to show a video for you where we can listen to one single cell in the hippocampus of this animal that is happily eating chocolate. And you also have to see that the rat is just concentrated on finding chocolate. Let's see if we can get the movie to. 
So here you listen to this one cell in the hippocampus, and the red dots, that's the action potential of this cell. And you see the rat is doing exactly the same thing when he's here and when he's there. But the cell knows exactly when the animal is up there and when it's down here, because here it's silent. And here we see the path of the animal, the white trace, and the red dots, that's the activity of this cell. And uh, this is the rate map. And warm colors is the peak rate, and the peak rate for this specific cell is 6 hertz. And Matt sitting here, Matt Wilson, he uh, showed together with uh, Bruce McNaughton that if you can record close to 100 such cells at the same time, you can predict where the animal is with one centimeter precision if you record for, say, 10 minutes. That's quite amazing. So this suggested then for John O'Keefe that these cells, they are uh, uh, elements of the brain's map space. And they even suggested that it's a cognitive map. So when my husband and me, Edward, uh, moved to Trondheim just after we came back from John O'Keefe's lab, <clears throat> we, we had this burning question in mind. How are these spatial signals in the hippocampus generated? And we wanted then to explore uh, the hippocampal circuit. So this is the hippocampus underneath the cortex. And uh, uh, you know that uh, the information here is going from the entorhinal cortex uh, to the dentate, to CA3 and up to CA1, back to subiculum and back to entorhinal cortex again. So what we thought was that if we blocked uh, this road going up to CA1, we can then ask whether there are still place cells in CA1. And surprisingly, when we recorded in such a preparation, so this is a crescent violet stain of uh, coronal section, and you see the CA3 is gone, and we could then record in CA1, the place cells look beautiful. So that led us to think maybe uh, the, the CA1 is receiving information upstream. And that led us to put our electrodes into this pink area, which is the entorhinal cortex. So this is the back of the brain. You see that cerebellum is removed. And this part here is the medial entorhinal cortex. And we wanted to record in the dorsal part of the medial entorhinal cortex, because that is the area that is projecting to the dorsal hippocampus, where John O'Keefe discovered the place cells. And if we then uh, play the movie again with the rat running around, doing like the rat with the hippocampal recordings, just chasing chocolate, we can ask, how does this cell react when the animal is uh, running around in the environment? So now there is no sound, there are just white dots where the animal, uh, no, where the cell is firing. And you see that the rat is running, 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 but already now, you see that it's quite messy, the activity. So maybe there is not good spatial uh, um, information in the entorhinal cortex. But if you have a happy animal, you get good coverage of the environment. And if we have this good coverage that we will have in a while, we just speed up the movie a bit, you start to see a pattern. So it looks like there's one hippocampal place field here, another hippocampal place field here, and so on. But this is in entorhinal cortex, and it's one cell, and you see that the activity is distributed throughout this environment. Not only is it distributed, this activity, but there's a certain pattern in this activity. What kind of pattern can we fit in here? A hexagon, yeah, and the smallest unit of a hexagon is an equilateral triangle. And you can just tile your bathroom or your kitchen floor, whatever you want, with these beautiful cells. And what is even more amazing is that this is from a brain. 
and the brain cell has to know when the animal is here, then it is allowed to fire, and this cell has to know that it shouldn't fire here, even though the rat is dancing around. That's quite amazing. So it has to get information both about speed and direction in order to do this calculation. And we suggested then that this is a universal 2D ruler so that you can measure how far you go in an environment. What is even more amazing is that if you think about where this grid cell is located in the brain, and I just borrowed this diagram from Fellerman and Van Essen, the visual hierarchy, starting with the retina and the eye here, further and further up in the hierarchy, hippocampus and entorhinal cortex is at the top of this hierarchy. So now you see that the grid pattern happens to be, or the grid cell happens to be in a place that this pattern has to be generated by the brain itself. It's not a response to, directly response to sensoric input, like you would find down here. And that make us being a bit brave when it comes to our vision, the grid cell may put us in, on the track of neural codes for mental functions because it's so far up in the cortical hierarchy. And when we found these cells, you could say this is a Nor Norwegian phenomenon. And we were so pleased when people started to report these cells in New York, in London, in France, everywhere. So it wasn't only a Norwegian phenomenon, but not even the least here, we ourselves found these cells in the mouse. The first ones uh, were in the, in the rat. And other groups in Israel, for example, Nahum Oladonsky's group found them in the bat. And the bat is uh, quite distant uh, phylogenetically from a mouse. And uh, Elizabeth Buffalo's group, they found uh, grid cells in, in, in the monkey. And Isaac Fried and Kahana reported grid cells in the humans. So this is quite relevant for us to try to understand these types of cells. So the next question I have here is, do we have one grid map that is just filling up the whole entorhinal cortex, or could there be several? And how can we find out? We can find out by looking at the grid structure. And the grid structure can vary along several dimensions. One dimension is where are the fields located in the environment? So that's the face. And the size of the grid, the scale of the grid might vary. And the orientation. So if you think about the grid cell as a mathematical paper that you can just bring with you everywhere. You know that you can rotate it, it can have a different scale, and, and, and so on. And what we've shown earlier in published work is that the face uh, is just random. Uh, so if you record close by cells, they will have uh, different faces. The scale is progress progressing from the dorsal to the ventral entorhinal cortex that I will show in a bit. And uh, in, at the end of the lecture, I'm going to tell you some really fun new data that are so fresh that I almost got them on the plane on the way here regarding orientation. But let's look at uh, the scale first of these grid cells. So this is a, um, a sagittal uh, section of a rat brain, you see the beautiful hippocampus here. You have the entorhinal cortex here, layer two here with, uh, uh, that we can record these grid cells. There are also grid cells in other layers. And you see that at the top here, uh, close to the entorhinal border, you have uh, small grid fields 
and a small distance between the fields, so it's a good resolution map. And then you move down to the ventral part, and I'm going to comment on this video, it's just <laughs> running. Uh, and here at the bottom, you can have very, very big grid fields. And that's why I show this movie here, because we asked also how big can these fields be? And then we didn't get a soccer field uh, to test these animals on in Norway, even though they have been really kind to us. But what we could do was to put up an 18 meter linear track in the lab and then let the rat gallop. I can show you again how beautiful galloping uh, the rat is. And he's not slim. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just galloping to get his chocolate at the end of the 18 meter linear track. And by, by letting the animals running on this linear track, we could measure how big this grid fields could be, and uh, they were at least three meters. Do you want to see him fetching the chocolate again? <laughs> He's a beautiful rat. Good style. Okay, there's the chocolate. So what we, what we ask then is, is it so that the scale is increasing like we put these dots on a balloon and we blow up gradually? Or are there different maps so that these scales jump in size? And to address that question, we needed to record many, many grid cells from one rat. And we had typically 200, close to 200 cells from each rat. And this figure just shows an example from rat 14257. So I think uh, this might be Omega. All the rats, they have names because they are pets. And the grid size here is on the y-axis and on the x-axis we have the position in the enterinal cortex, so it's more and more ventral. And what I want you to, to, to focus on here, you start, as I said, with the small grid scale here, and then it's jumping to the next level, and to the next level, and to the next level. And we use the k-means uh, clustering procedure to show that these clusters were distinct. And we call these clusters different modules or different maps. And what is so interesting is, do you see a pattern who is, yeah, this is MIT, so you all are good in mathematics, of course, why should I ask? But do you see <laughs> the secret number that is between these different steps? How can we find the secret number? We can take module one or map, uh, um, the, the, the bigger of the modules and divide by the smaller ones. And these are the different values for each rat. And the cross is the average. And what you see here is that this ratio between the, the, the scales there of the grids is constant. So it's increasing in a geometric function. So the grid scale is increasing by one for two each time it's moving from one map to the next. And that's the square root of two. And of course, the set point in, 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 uh, in each rat is, is different, but if you have enough cells and rats, then you can find this. And then there are some People doing computer models like uh, 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 Alexander Mattis and uh, John Hertz and all these, uh, no, Andreas Hertz and these people. And they have made a model showing that uh, a geometric progression may be optimal to represent the environment uh, with the highest uh, resolution, with a minimum number of cells. So what we ask then, is it so that these maps 
are or modules are independent. So how can we find out? We can manipulate the environment and ask if these maps are reacting differently to the different uh, man manipulations. And it was a very, very simple experiment. So we recorded grid cells in this box that is quite big, 1.5 meter. And then just squeezing in one wall. So that is one meter here and 1.5 meter here. And then uh, put the, uh, pulling out the wall again. And then we asked, how do the grid cells react to this manipulation in the environment? Here are some examples from the same, uh, uh, from the same route. And these are the small modules and these are the larger modules. This is before we squeeze the box. This is during the squeezing and this is afterwards. And what you see here with the smaller modules is that when we squeeze the box, it was like we chopped off the grid pattern. Do you see that? So it's these, these grid fields here are gone. And that means that the best correlation here, if we are trying to stretch the map afterwards, is when you don't stretch it. But here, with the bigger modules, you have to stretch it the full length in order to get a correlation between the original map and the, 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 the squeezed map. So that means that these different modules react differently to this manipulation. And why is that important? Because this is fed into the hippocampus. And you remember both in Clive and with HM, hippocampus is important both for spatial memory and for, for, um, for, uh, for, for memory in general. And if you're going to generate different memories in the hippocampus, then an efficient way to do that is that the grid cells are independent and they can react independently to the different uh, environments or inputs that you have. And when you then uh, have, uh, when you sum up the activity of the grid cells, you can get uh, a play cell activity here. I'm going to show in a, in a different figure how this is done, but at least this is a way to separate different memories in the hippocampus the, uh, to, to, uh, to have um, the shifts in the grid cells. So the question here is how can you go from the grid input to the hippocampus so that we can get a play cell activity as a result. And that is what we remember. This is the place field, this is the grid field, and how can you go from, from one to the other. You can do this linear summation, as I said. So if you think about the different scaled uh, grid cells here, you just uh, put them on top of each other, you align them, then you see that uh, here it's cancelling the activity out when you do the linear summation, and in the middle it's summed up so that you get one field like here. So this was a model that not only our group came up with, but, but, but a lot of other groups also suggested that this is a way to get place fields in the hippocampus. But you know that science is more complicated than this. So if you think you have a solution to a problem, you don't. So we found later that intermingled with the grid cells, there are also other types of cells. One type of cell was discovered in another structure of the brain by uh, Jim Rank and uh, Taubib and he published these uh, cells in 1990, and that is the head direction cell. So if you want to do spatial navigation, it doesn't help you only to know where you are and how far you have gone, but you also need to know the direction. 
and you get the direction here by this head direction set. So what happens here is that when an animal is moving in an environment, when it's facing its head towards one certain direction, this cell is firing and then it's turning off if the uh, animal is uh, turning its head. So that's why it's called a head direction. And the polar plot shows that. So whenever the rat is moving towards west, this cell is active. And when it's moving to other directions, it's, uh, it's silent. And this cell has a different preference. So that was the first cell that uh, coexists with the grid cells. And then in 2008, we also discovered the other type of cell that we called the border cells. And these cells, they are active along the borders of the environment, like you see here. And then you can stretch the wall here, and you see that it's still signaling the wall. You can stretch the wall in the y direction, and it's still active along the whole wall. You can remove the walls and it's still active because there are edges to the environment. You can give uh, the rat another wall or a mirror that we gave to Emma here. And you see that this cell is active uh, also in the insert wall. And another cell type that we just got is the speed cell. And I told you in order to get, to, to generate the grid cell activity, we need information about the speed of the animal. And this experiment was done by Emilio Croft uh, in, in our lab. And uh, it was inspired by Flint. How many of you have seen Flintstone before? Oh, some. <laughs> Good. So what is special about the Flintstone car? <laughs> Do you know how the, he's driving? Like this. And that is exactly what Emilio's rat had to do. Emilio's rat had to be on this car, and the car was moved by a motor, and the rat had to run at different speeds because the car was driving, but he had to run in order to drive it. And what you see here is that whenever the speed is changing, this cell will follow the speed of the car. And different cells have different preference to, to different speeds. So this is a, a, a cell that uh, is very important for path integration, uh, we think. So this leaves us with this problem that the simple transformation from grid cells to play cells from 2006 does not account for these new uh, cell types. And also, during development, it seems like the different cell types mature at different ty times. So we might also ask here, maybe the nature has solved this by not letting all these different types talk to the hippocampus. Maybe it is so that it is only the grid cells that send information to the hippocampus, and not the head direction cells, and not the, the border cells. So how can we find out? So I'm a psychologist, so then we had to, in our lab, we had to, to hire people who know molecular biology, so I could take on a molecular biology hat. And what we did, this is all published, was uh, to use the AV virus that would then infect cells in the hippocampus and also infect axons coming from the entorhinal cortex. And since uh, these were combined with uh, channel rhodopsin, we could record then cells in the entorhinal cortex at the same time that we could stimulate these with light, with the optic fiber. And then we could ask, if we record a grid cell, it is infected if it's responding to the light. If it's a head direction cell, it's infected if it's responding to the light and so on. And what we found was that all cell types responded to this light. And there were a lot of control experiments and so on. So if you want to check, you can see this, this paper. But the main message here is that it isn't so simple that it's only the grid cells that are projecting to, uh, to the hippocampus. 
In addition, we have this problem with the development, as I said, because if this linear summation model would be perfect, then the grid cells would be mature before the place cells, and that is not the case. So both we and uh, Don O'Keefe with Wills et al. as the first author showed that the place cells are mature before the grid cells are. The grid cells are there, but they're not beautiful hexagon activity, so they're not clean, and not so many of them. But what is interesting is that the border cells are born very early on, and just after the, the animal has opened its eyes at around day 15, this beautiful, uh, uh, this is at P17, these beautiful border cells uh, could be uh, recorded. So this fits with an idea that uh, John O'Keefe and, and uh, Neil Burgess and Tom Hartley and all these people in London suggested that maybe it's possible to use this border cell activity uh, to create place fields in the hippocampus. And there are some problems with that because these are just active along the wall, so that means that these, uh, these uh, cells in the middle would have some, um, with fields in the middle would have some problems. So there's something that we need to find out, but at least there's a possibility. So the question is then, how is it with one single place field sitting in the hippocampus, getting all this information? And then I'm just borrowing here a slide from uh, Arthur Connett's group where he did uh, uh, optical recording of a cell in uh, V1 uh, in visual cortex. And he could then also uh, uh, um, see the activity of the different inputs to this cell by calcium imaging. And he stimulated the cell and these inputs by showing the animal different oriented uh, bars. And what he could show is that different inputs had different preference for these different orientations. And if you think about this as not as an a, a, a orientation selective cell, but as a place cell, you could imagine that these are head direction input, border cell input, grid cell input, and so on. And what Connett could show in his group was that even though there's this mix of input, the res end result for the cell is highly selective. And uh, uh, Karl Swoboda showed this. So, so these, the sample here of synapses were quite small, but Karl Swoboda sort of confirmed that uh, the, the output is an average of uh, a quite diverse inputs. So Karl Swoboda had around 200 synapses that he could uh, uh, look at. So if it's so that the hippocampus is receiving this mix of input. Is the hippocampus confused? And what, how can the hippocampus deal with its confusion? Is there a selection mechanism within the hippocampus that can pick out information from the border cells or from the head direction cells or from the grid cells at different times? There's one mechanism that we know about, at least one mechanism that we know about, that is a good selector for information and how a different system can talk to each other. And that is synchronization, uh, for example, uh, with the gamma rhythm or other types of brain rhythms that can make communication between distant areas much more easy. And you have good phase relation, that is if they talk to, uh, to the other structure when um, both of them are depolarized and there is a bad phase relation. So in this way, the brain can select input because, uh, or, or select inputs that resonate with the local frequency. And, sorry, and that we have shown in our lab with Laura Colgin in our lab, who showed this uh, beautiful work where she recorded in C1 of the hippocampus, and she could then uh, uh, show them that uh, uh, C1 could shift 
its uh, frequency and would then be synchronized to CA3 at a slow gamma and synchronized to the middle and rhino cortex with fast gamma. We followed up this oscillation thinking uh, when we wanted to explore another structure also giving input to the hippocampus that we haven't talked about yet, and that is the lateral entorhinal cortex. So up to now, we've been talking about the medial entorhinal cortex. So what does the lateral entorhinal cortex do for the hippocampus? At least what we know is that the lateral entorhinal cortex is receiving a lot of olfactory input, feeding then the hippocampus with this input. And then I want to show you a video here. Do you recognize this scene? <coughs> Have you seen this movie? I haven't seen the movie. I've just seen the scene because I haven't had time to see it. But it's about a rat in France in this really fantastic restaurant. And the rat is the chef. And he's making the most beautiful food. And this scene is from when the critics is sitting there testing the food from the rat. And he's so unhappy and I don't like this and blah, blah, blah. So what you can see here is what happens when he's testing this food. And what I want to illustrate here is that hippocampus stores associations between odor and space. And his hippocampus is working at full speed, as you will see in this movie. You see, he's sent back to his mom. So just this taste and these odors from this beautiful food from the rat was linking his memory or his mind to something that had happened long time ago. So, and he even, his emotions changed. <laughs> <laughs> Who cooks the ratatouille? I demand to know! Oh, so he's not happy about the rat. But we ask... <laughs> how, how can we test this in the lab? How can we test how olfactory information is selected? Can we test that in the lab? Do you know about the task that you can tell us to do? We have one. And this is so that the rat is told that if he's smelling chocolate, he should go to position A. If he's uh, smelling banana, he should go to position B. And um, our students, uh, our postdocs, uh, Kay and uh, our student Lee, trained this animal for a long time so that they would reach an asymptotic level to 85% correct. And I can uh, see if this video works so that you can see how a rat is behaving when he is smelling this odor. Sorry. Okay, odor. Good. Well done. So you see, he's, he's sent to, to the different places by just smelling exactly like we saw in the movie with a man who was sent to his mom. Oh, it's not perfect all the time. Now he was smelling too short, so he was punished by not getting anything. And then he starts to explore, what's wrong? I want my uh, chocolate. And now he can do it again. So what we were interested in was to understand what happens in the brain when this animal is learning this task. And then, of course, we wanted to put our electrodes in the lateral and cortex 
and in the hippocampus at the same time. And first, we recorded the EEG. I think he has proved that he can do the task, hasn't he? So we recorded the EEG first, as I said, in the distal C1. That is the part of C1 that is receiving input from the lateral entorhinal cortex and in the lateral entorhinal cortex and also in the medial entorhinal cortex to compare. And this orange part here, this is time and this is the frequency of the EEG. This orange part is when the animal is smelling the odor and it has to sample the odor. And you see that something happens here in this frequency between 20 to 40 hertz. And the same thing happens in the lateral entorhinal cortex, but not in the medial entorhinal cortex. So what we can ask is, is it so that there's a link between CA1 and uh, lateral entorhinal cortex? Are they synchronized? Yes, they are. So if we see the coherence between the distal C1 and the lateral entorhinal cortex uh, on the different uh, EEGs, so then you see that it's a high coherence in this band, 20 to 40 hertz. But that is not the case between distal C1 and the medial entorhinal cortex. And this is uh, when the rat really knows the task. And this is just to, to, to sum it up. So you see between these frequencies here, the, it's a high coherence between these two areas. So then we might ask, is this something that is there like this? Or does it develop with learning? And it does. So when we start, when the rat is quite naive on this task, there's not uh, much coherence between these structures, lateral and entorhinal and cortex and the this is C1. But you see that it starts to develop. And then when it comes to the asymptotic level, it's just beautiful. But what if the rat is doing an error? What do you think? How does it look like? Is there coherent activity then? Can you vote, please? Mm -hmm. Who is voting for coherent activity during errors? One, two, three. <laughs> OK, let's check. There is not uh, much coherent activity here during errors. And to, to be fair, we downsampled the number of trials here so that uh, we could compare it with the number of trials during the errors. And uh, still, uh, uh, with correct behavior, there's a strong coherence between these uh, brain areas, but not during errors. So then if you record the cells in these areas, do you think that they will also change their activity? The play cells? Yes, they do. So we see a, a development of odor maps. So there is a place field, and then during the learning of this odor, the odor map is put on top of the place map and increasing uh, in firing. And then uh, uh, red color are those cells that will increase the firing towards odor A, and green color are those that uh, will increase the firing towards the other odor. And this is the math behind it. And again, you see that during errors, this odor map is not expressed. So what does this tell us? It tells us that the different network oscillations may couple the hippocampus temporarily with different regions of the entorhinal cortex. And there's a big selection. It's both the medial entorhinal cortex and the lateral, and all the different information within the medial entorhinal cortex that can be coupled by these network oscillations. Coupling with different oscillators in the entorhinal cortex may enable play cells to listen to different inputs during different behaviors. And the development of coherent firing within the distal uh, C1 and the lateral entorhinal cortex may create functional ensembles, just a group of cells or these odor maps. 
And uh, I didn't show that, but they're also modulated by this EEG so that uh, the spikes are coming so close that you can get uh, HEBI and LTP between them. So firing together, wiring together. So I could also say very briefly here, because I see I, I'm, I'm running out of time, that uh, uh, it seems like there is a development uh, of uh, uh, correct behavior here, the black line, that follows, uh, uh, that is followed by the coherence between the lateral entorhinal cortex and the CA1, and the development of odor map in the lateral entorhinal cortex. But CA1 is a bit slower. So it seems like maybe C1 has to learn from the lat lateral and rhinal cortex to do this task. But the last question, and that is the fresh data that I got almost on the plane that I will uh, talk about now, is addressing this question. The order map is superimposed on the place map, like episodes, like our memory. We use the, the, the place cell system to put our memories on top of. How are spatial maps kept stable in the environment? Because if the, the spatial maps are not kept stable, our memories are not uh, stable either. So that is what I said here. To be useful for memory navigation, grid cells, they have to anchor to the external reference frames. And then we can ask, what are these reference frames? Are they landmarks? Are they uh, the shape of the environment? How? What we know is that it's true that the grid fields uh, are stable across trials. And that was uh, shown already in 2005. This is tri uh, trial one, trial two, three different cells. And you see that uh, the fields are located exactly the same place. And these fields can be stable for weeks, months, and Flecken, he lived for one year. And uh, I think uh, his cells were really, really stable. Another phenomenon here is that if you, so in all these tasks where we test the animal, we have an environment where we have a big cue card. And if we have curtains around the environment so that the animal is focusing on this cue card, we can rotate the whole environment. And what happens then is that the, the, the whole map is rotating together with, uh, with uh, the, the cue card. So that means that somehow these grid cells, they have to anchor to landmarks in the environment. And maybe a cue card, maybe something uh, different. And how is that done? What is also fascinating is that if you check the orientation of different grid cells in an environment, so this stripe is just showing how the grid is oriented in an environment, it seems like it's quite similar between animals. So is there an external factor in the environment that can tell the grid cell how to orient in the environment? Maybe. So these uh, uh, plots here are just uh, two demonstrations from two different rooms. We call them the galaxy plots. So, so if we focus here on, on one room, here the box is 150 by 150. And what uh, we've done, or the, that uh, means the PhD students, what they have done, uh, Tor and, and Hanne, uh, they have marked the, the fields here, the inner fields of the grid, with one dot. And then the next field is getting another dot. And then this would be one grid field. And then you have all these uh, different cells, close to yeah, 587 cells uh, plotted on top of each other with different scales. And what, what, what do you see here regarding the orientation? So this is, this is the box coordinates here, x-axis, y-axis. 
it looks quite stable, doesn't it, the orientation? So all of these cells, they sort of relate to this wall in the environment. Do you see that? So if you have rotated it like a, a, a clock, then this is the axis that they are relating to. This, these cells from these animals, 220 cells, they choose two walls. This wall and this wall. And what is even more strange is that it's not perfectly aligned to the walls. There is an offset. And the offset is seven and a half degrees. So I started in mathematics, I went into psychology, and now I'm back to mathematics. And what you see here is that it's avoiding zero and 15 degrees and having a peak here at uh, seven and a half degrees. And if we just move this histogram to this side, everything is at seven and a half degrees. So this is how the grid is orienting itself towards the walls. And I was playing with this idea here and uh, suggested uh, by, by discussions, uh, of course, uh, Tor and Hanna thought of, of, of this before uh, me, was that when, when you have an angle, if you have the grid and it's a big triangular, when you have an angle of 30 degrees between the grid and the wall, the other wall would also have 30 degrees. If you have 15 degrees, you would have 15 degrees. Hmm? Yes, here. But if you have seven and a half degree, you would have a different distance from this axis to this axis. And in this way, the different grid cells would differentiate between these two walls. And the geometry of the environment is extremely important for the rat when it's finding its way in an environment. And in order to test this, uh, Tor and Hanna did simulations, and they just simulated cells uh, with same orientation and same uh, spacing for each, uh, each uh, simulation, but then different spacing and different orientation um, uh, for, 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 for each map here, and then they uh, just asked, if, if you do this simulation and then correlate activity between this segment close to this wall and this segment close to this wall, then we can ask, how can you get the least correlated information? When is the grid located in the environment so that uh, the grid can distinguish between this wall and this wall? That's the question. And the simulations showed what we uh, uh, saw in the data. At seven and a half degree, the correlation is at the lowest, highest at 15, and so it goes. And that is also, um, oh, I thought I had deleted that. So, so, so this is just to put the simulation upside down and the, 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 the recorded data here. Seeing here, seven and a half has the smallest correlation, but highest representation among the cells. And then we were so astonished by this. How is it possible? So one thing is, how can the grid cell know when to be active and when to be silent? But how can the grid cell know what is seven and a half degrees towards one wall? Crazy, if you ask me. And I was just, no, this is, this is, uh, this is uh, so strange. 
And then I went back to the already published paper and then I almost fainted because I saw 15 degrees. And I, I ran to, uh, to Tor and Hanna and said, we have just published 15 degrees, what should we do? We can't publish seven and a half. And what happened then was this, just crazy. So Tor and Hanna played with the grid map of Omega, one of uh, our rats. And it seems like the grid activity, the grid cell can dissolve so that one part of the grid cell can uh, have seven and a half degrees to one wall, one wall, but another part of the grid cell can map up to the other wall. And we've seen this before, and that was in an already published study where, that we call the hairpin maze study, that you can reset the map in each corridor. So by putting up walls in the environment, the grid cell starts over and over again. So here, if you go back to this, there is this diagonal. So this map is one map in the grid cell, and this map is another map that is aligning to the different walls. Crazy. OK. So I just wanted to, to show here who uh, did all this work. So we have a, a fantastic group of people. And this year we had snow. Now we don't have snow in Trondheim, but you see we had snow here. So of course, Edward, my husband, he has been involved in, in all this work and all these maps. Uh, it's uh, all published data. I want to also say, especially Menno Witter, he's working uh, in Trondheim is involved in, in much of these studies. And the mechanisms, I didn't have time to talk about how do you generate the grid cell, but that is uh, Yasarudi's group. The modules, and also the seven and a half degree, that is this couple, they have a two year old daughter, no, three maybe. And now they're expecting twins. Productive in the lab, productive everywhere. <laughs> and this is Kay, who did the oscillations to, uh, together with Laura Colgin, who has now got a job in Texas. Emilio with the speed cells. And this is uh, uh, the people who found uh, the, the grid cells together with us. And Alessandro Treves, who has also been collaborating with us for a long time. And um, uh, yeah, the, 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 the border cells, Trygve, Solstar, and, and so on. And um, oh. Oh, okay, I thought I lost the funding. <laughs> so we got a lot of support from, uh, from our local university, Antony. Kavli Foundation has been fantastic. The Norwegian Research Council uh, with the Center of Excellence and uh, the European uh, Research Council and um, yeah, Louis Jontier Foundation. So we, we get a lot of support. And thank you for being patient with me. I've spent too much time talking about these data, but Thank you for the attention. Okay, so we have time for a few questions. That was really beautiful. And I was just so curious, have you looked at the orientation um, in other environments that are not rectangular, triangles? Um, I think I have that slide here. I hope I didn't delete it because you are asking, for example, what happens in a circle. And uh, these data are so fresh, so we haven't sort of been thinking uh, enough. Uh, but it seems like in, in a circle, you don't have this regular orientation like you have in uh, the square boxes. It's, it's, it's more varied. But what we are discussing now is that maybe the Q card could help with some of the orientation, but uh, we don't know. So we are exploring different shapes of environments to address your question.
Uh, when you were doing exper experiments with coherence, I was just w w wondering, since you have an attractant right there, have you tried do, doing an extin extinction of that, trying to look at avo avoidance? They seem to be having a place firing at borders at a wall, showing that they do that they do have obstacles. But I'm wondering if you have have something that is not attractive, something that you don't want to navigate, uh, na navigate to, would you find the same oscillatory coherence? Uh, I don't know if you understand my question or not. Uh, yeah, no, so, so it's about the coherence the experiment that we did uh, in, in the lateral and trinal cortex and the coherence between right. lateral and trinal cortex and right. the CA1 it's and avoidance that I didn't because, know. Because it's said to be in a well-trained well rat right there that's yes. said to have the, have the circuit. At the subtotic right level. Mm -hmm. And you won't have... And I'm just curious because on the wrong on the wrong trials, it doesn't have have that firing coherence right there. But is yeah. there any feedback to say they're saying that this is a wrong one? And if you reinforce oh, that that's a good question. If you okay. reinforce that, if you extinguish that, and you have telling yeah. you to avoid this instead, no, no, no. would you have a, the opposite effect or not? Yeah, that's, what, that's so, what I'm wondering. Yeah, no. So, so, so that that's a, that's a wonderful question. So, what what we think is that. Uh, uh, the lateral and trinal cortex and the hippocampus need to talk to each other in order for the rat to remember which position to go to. And if something happens with this communication so that there is not coherent activity in this 20 to 40 hertz band, then there is no communication between the lateral and trinal cortex and C1 that is good enough for the behavior to be correct. So that is what we're thinking. But uh, I agree, we, if, if you could block the coherence also artificially by putting in channel reducine or hyaluronidopsine or whatever you could, and then uh, manipulate this, then you could also ask, could you sort of erase the memory or the behavior so that he could start to do errors? Maybe by manipulation of the spatial organization, you would check No, so, so, so that's also true that uh, they need the, the, the spatial map intact in order to do this task because they have to know where to go. And what is so fascinating about that is that uh, the best method for us to remember long lists of words or numbers or whatever is to use spatial memory, of course. So there was a children program uh, on television in Norway where the, the program um, leader of this program, she had to learn 20 countries, 20 cities in those countries. She would also uh, say if, uh, how they were related to each other, the borders of these countries. And she had to learn this in 20 minutes. And you would say this is an impossible task. But it wasn't impossible because she was taught to use her spatial memory in order to remember this. So what she did was that um, uh, she used uh, the house or, or her home and then she placed the different memories in different rooms so that she could have neighboring rooms with neighboring countries. And in each room she had to have two... Uh, two um, ideas of, of, of this country and, and uh, uh, the city. So for example, for Tur Turkey, it would be, um, this is in Norwegian, so it would be a tyr, it's an ox, <laughs> and an anchor, and then it was uh, Turkey and Ankara. And then she had all these uh, uh, imagination for, for the different countries. And then she could just do this mental travel going from one room to the next to just sample her mem memories. And she did this task with no errors. So the spatial uh, navigation system is just perfect. And it's the same cells in the hippocampus that are dealing with place and memory. Question. So, um, rats probably have not involved in environments with walls. If anything, they were running out in the open field with maybe very local landmarks like rocks, trees, and things like that. So, what does the angular offset data that you just showed mean with res respect to how they have evolved um, these kinds of mechanisms? And the other question is, 
Um, maybe for the uh, speed cells you mentioned briefly, humans now can travel in very fast speeds, probably unprecedented, uh, unprecedented um, speeds. So what are the uh, flexibility for these maps to scale up? Are there limits? Like, do, do we you know, adjust with respect to what we perceive? Like, what, what do you think of those kinds of things? Well, that's a really exciting question. So for the, for the, for the last one, uh, we know that we can still uh, at least drive the car even though our speeds are above speed limits. That's easy in Norway because they are so low. But, uh, and, but, but um, uh, I think you're right with the plasticity because when you break, then you don't break fast enough uh, because you have this speed illusion. So you have sort of learned to be in this very high speed. So when you want to break and go out to the gasoline station, you don't, at least if you, if you don't think about it, then uh, you think you are driving slower than what you do. And uh, regarding the environment of um, the animals, um, exciting question, but no data, I'm sorry. So, but absolutely, so, so, so that is why we are exploring all these things to start to learn how are these activity patterns generated and how are they formed, how are they anchored, what can we learn about this, uh, these uh, cells? Because if we can learn something of these cells, we think we can learn also something about the brain in general, we hope. I was just wondering, you're talking about the importance of visual input when the, the maps are kind of being developed. Um, once they're already established, is visual input important for like retaining that information? So say, you know, with the, mm -hmm. um, the smelling task, if you blindfolded the rat after it's done that a few times, would it still be able to find the location? Um, and I, I was also wondering if, if there's anything known about the place in visual system where like the projection happens? Because um, you were talking about V1, so it's, does it go, like, is there any retinotopy or, like, I, I, I guess I was just curious about the visual yeah. input. So, uh, regard, um, that was many questions, so you have to probably have to help me, but, uh, but uh, there's no retinotopy in the entrinal cortex as far as I know, but maybe Bob knows <laughs> more about that. But talking about uh, odor input, for example, we see that uh, uh, in the odor cortex, uh, even then it's, uh, it's not uh, any topographical organization of the odor input. So I, I don't expect that to be in, in the entrinal cortex either. So the, the direct sensoric link to what happens in the entrinal cortex is lost on the way. So it's more associated and also associated with uh, different inputs. So that was, that was one question and then it was, Oh, my, my um, memory is so bad, I'm sorry. Is this about, how, I guess, how visual input helps um, like create the map? Yeah. So, so what is interesting with, uh, with the grid cells is, uh, like I said, it's like a 2D metric. And we think that it's useful for path integration. And path integration you can use without visual input. So you can just close your eyes and you can start somewhere, you can move, and then you integrate the speed and the direction and you can go back to where you started. But you need visual input in order to, to anchor the grid, we think. And that is also what I, I, I showed when, when uh, we have this cue card in the environment and when you rotate the environment, then we rotate the whole map. And not only the grid cells are rotated, the head direction cells will rotate, the, the play cells will rotate, and everything will rotate as a full map. And that is also quite exciting because when, when people talk about these head direction cells, they think that uh, these are compass cells or to the magnetic poles, but it's a subjective head direction system that is plastic that you can just move around. Okay, I'm sure there are many more questions. Um, you can ask Maybrit um, questions at the reception that will be outside right now. And let's thank uh, her one more time for coming to the